Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Lucero, and I'm the chair of Latin American Caribbean Studies here at the University of Washington, and uh, really excited uh, to host, to be one of the co-hosts of today's conversation with uh, Doug Myro, who's one of the creators and executive producers and writers for Narcos and Narcos Mexico. Um, we'll say a little bit more about Doug in a second, but I also wanted to uh, let my colleague Vanessa Frije say a little bit about herself. Thanks, Tony. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you, Doug, for joining us. I'm Vanessa Frigi. I'm an assistant professor in the Jackson School of International Studies, and I work on Mexico. So before we get started with the conversation, I did want to acknowledge that we are in a virtual space, but Vanessa and I are joining from the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people, the Duwamish, Sequamish, Muckleshoot and Toledo peoples and, and other native peoples who uh, call this part of the world home. Um, and we're also lucky to be in conversation with Doug, who's joining us from Southern California, where it's considerably warmer than it is here in Seattle uh, and the traditional homelands of the Tongva people. Uh, this uh, at, this event is part of a series on uh, narco narratives that uh, Vanessa and I have have put together. Uh, we've already had one terrific conversation um, uh, uh, yesterday uh, with uh, Oswaldo Savala, who has a really interesting new book that's coming up from Vanderbilt University Press uh, called Do, uh, Do Cartels Exist? Uh, did I get that right, Vanessa? Do drug cartels exist? The cartels do not exist. Uh, you answered the cartels. question. <laughs> you answered the question. They don't exist. So it's a very provocative book. Uh, it's something that I that it was a great conversation that Vanessa had with uh, Oswaldo yesterday, and that those recordings will be available soon on the website of Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Um, we also, uh, you can look on that page for upcoming events. Uh, we'll have a great conversation with historian um, Adela Cedillo, um, who will be talking about her research, uh, thinking about dirty wars and drug wars in Mexico as well. Uh, I want to uh, say that this uh, event is made possible by uh, the Latin American Caribbean Studies Program and uh, the Jackson School of International Studies, and also a special thank you to the Calderwood Foundation. Uh, this uh, conversation is attached to a couple of seminars that Vanessa and I are teaching here at the University of Washington to help our undergraduates uh, find ways to translate academic knowledge uh, into more publicly accessible forms of scholarship. So it's a real um, wonderful opportunity to be able to talk with one of the creators of, of Narcos, um, on which as I don't think anybody needs to know what Narcos is, but it is an incredibly successful Netflix series. And um, Doug has been a part of this enterprise from the beginning, and we really appreciate his willingness to join us in conversation as we think about the difficult decisions about taking actual historical events and translating them into these different formats and these different genres. And just to get us all in the right space, uh, we're not gonna spend, uh, unfortunately, we, I mean, we'd love to talk about several scenes uh, through the episode, but we just wanna show just a, about a minute or so, um, just so folks have a, a sense of the kind of work and the kind of production that has gone into telling the story. So I'm just gonna share my screen for one minute and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll chat with Doug. I'm going to tell you about how the drug war in Mexico began. And it was boss, Miguel Felix Gallardo. I don't think there's a trafficant more powerful in Mexico. Mr. Camarera, welcome to Guadalajara. Miguel is fired across with the DEA for the last time tonight. Vamos! He did it to Mexico City. Every second counts, Kiki. So show them what they're not seeing. We're running out of time. Esto no lo voy a contar. Lo sabes qué? Tú tampoco. So now that our blood is pumping a little faster, uh, I think it, it, uh, it's a good moment to say a word more about our, our guest, uh, Doug Myro. Doug, in addition to his uh, really impressive work on Narcos and Narcos Mexico, has many uh, credits on his impressive resume. Uh, he's been a writer for 
really some uh, really interesting films that include uh, The Great Raid, The Uninvited, uh, Prince of Persia, uh, and The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, Doug studied uh, screenwriting at the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts, and before that, he has a, a degree in English from Stanford University, and in full, full disclosure, Doug and I were actually college roommates. So uh, this is a, a conversation that I'm really happy it has uh, spanned a few decades and it gives me an opportunity to connect one of my current friends, Vanessa Frege, whose work on Mexico I admire so much with an, a much older friend who's he's very old now, like I think he's in his 50s now, uh, uh, and, and a chance to talk about these different challenges of, of Mexico. So before anything else, Doug, welcome to this virtual Thank conversation. You. It's good to see some things never change. <laughs> <laughs> Still giving me a hard time. <laughs> always, always. And we're, we're, we're going to continue to give you a hard time for about another hour or so. And we I'm excited. I'm really happy to be here. I really appreciate you guys asking me, and I appreciate the conversation. I think it's an important one, and it's one um, that we are always happy to have uh, about Narcos. Awesome. So we have a, a few questions for you, and there is also a Q and A uh, function here for people who are watching. Feel free at any time for folks to put in those questions, and Vanessa and I will be keeping an eye out, our eye out for those questions and uh, and have um, more of a, of a of an organic kind of discussion. But um, Vanessa, I'll, I'll turn it to you for the for the to start off our, our conversation. Sure, sounds good. Um, so I wanted to to start by asking a little bit of a process question. So the Narcos Netflix project is seems, it feels different from traditional Hollywood representations of Latin America in the sense that it, it spends, spans many years and countries. And it also, as many people have commented on, uh, takes, or it's filmed in different languages, right? You know, Spanish and English. And so we wanted to ask you what it was like um, working with Latin American writers, actors, and collaborator, and also working with Latin American stories? Um, well, so uh, I, 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 we, you know, I wrote, I write for, I wrote for a long time with Carlo Bernard, who I grew up with, and he and I had done uh, a number of, you know, these uh, period pieces that involved different cultures and were often asked to write in that sort of traditional British ease, I guess they call it. It's like the period language, <laughs> like where people from other cultures speaking kind of an English, like a bad English accent. Um, and we always hated it. We'd always like put their dialogue in italics and hold out hope that we could get someone who spoke Farsi or her, you know, like get the actual language. and. Um, um, I'm sort of just hitting the first part of your question, then I'll get into the second, because I think it's interesting and relevant. When we pitched Narcos to Netflix, which at the time was just a fledgling, you know, send out a DVD in a red envelope company um, ha that had House of Cards and had a few executives looking to develop some series, but had sort of figured this thing out of this idea of having these very cinematic series. Um, and I can talk if you'd like more about their reasons for doing Narcos and the way that expanded their audience and the reasons for making these choices. But when we did the pitch, we finished and they said, how much do you want it to be in Spanish? And we said, like we always did, we want everybody who would speak Spanish to speak Spanish, <laughs> you know, thinking they were going to be like, oh, hem and ha and be, you know, say, oh, but could some, could we do this? They said, great, as much Spanish as you could put in. And honestly, it, I know it sounds silly, but we almost fell out of our chairs because we were like, never heard that before. At that time in Hollywood, it was verboten to like have other languages in your series. But what Netflix was seeing and, you know, they are very progressive, but it's a numbers driven company. They were seeing that people were A, willing to read subtitles because they had a number of films on their site that showed that people were willing to do that to a degree. Um, and they liked our mixture because we kind of had, a, obviously with the, the cop point of view, it allowed us for some English, to have some English. And, um, and their intention was to expand their South American audience. At the time when we pitched this, um, um, the, the internet quality in America was actually worse. The streaming ability in America was worse than anywhere in South America. So what Netflix was seeing was that their big uh, uh, markets that were available to them to be able to really stream the way we like to stream now, um, keep in mind, this is almost 10 years ago, 
um, were really in South American and Central American countries. Countries like Brazil and Argentina had done much better job of investing in their infrastructure uh, uh, of streaming services. Um, so that was a way for Netflix, which had already realized that as a subscription company, they need to get as many people as possible. It's a really tough business, as we're seeing with their finances now, um, to, to maintain. So this was a way to, to appeal to those audiences. And it was, I admit, fairly calculating, you know, even if in there's a lot of things that it opened up for us, it was a great opportunity to tell stories that hadn't been told. But for Netflix, there was a real economic drive to it, which I think is at the heart of this discussion of how these we expand to new audiences. Is economic drivers are are often really important, especially in Hollywood, and that was the case here. So now getting into the second part of your question, there was also a calculation because we had partnered with Jose Padilla, who is the director of the pilot and had an influence, very strong influence on the first season. Um, you can see Jose's fingerprints on the series in the archival footage and in the sort of very cinema verite kind of quality of the cinematography. Uh, the insistence on shooting on location was all of us, but very much driven by Jose. Um, if you haven't seen Jose's movies and you like, you know, any like South American cinema, you have to see him. They're, they're amazing. Uh, if you watch Elite Squad 1 and 2, you'll see influences that really register with Narcos. You'll see Wagner as well in early days, like playing a cop in a very traditionally, not a very untraditional climate of, of political corruption, which I can talk about too the fascination with and the understanding of the politics of the day, but we all shared a love of research. But to just to get to the bottom of that question about how we, so that was the first partnership with a Latin American filmmaker. And then what Jose did and how Jose drove that was really important because his, his involvement then gave us access to so much. And that has always been the key for us with Narcos. And in the case of Jose, his instinct was to um, enlist as many actors from as many South and Central American countries as he could because he knew and he had the insight, which is fairly obvious, but I think not obvious to Americans, that in a lot of these countries, um, people will watch if one of their stars is in the show. I mean, you see this like very clearly, like with them dropping like BTS stars or K-pop stars into like Marvel movies, you know, it's 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 the same idea and it has gone on for a long time in South America where you cast from different countries and those countries will show up to watch so um, we did cast from a variety of countries we always hired off of Jose um, South American Central American filmmakers they were essential to our uh, execution of the series because we uh, and Eric Newman, who very much drove this process and was the producer who first brought this idea to us, um, had an insistence, which I we all agreed on, of letting this be a very cinematic process. And, and the, what I mean by that is typically in television, the writers are overseeing a lot of the production. They function almost as producers, directors, and writers, and for better or for worse, um, I'm not gonna get into the that as much, but in the case of Narcos, we as screenwriters came at it from a very movie point of view, which is to say, we allowed our filmmakers to be filmmakers. Because we had Jose, we wanted him to be a filmmaker. And therefore, then going forward, all of our directors were allowed that leeway to take the script and handle them in the way they would a, a movie, you know, and, and it was both the instinct to have the cinematic quality, but also to allow them to put their imprint on the material. And in the process of that, in addition to a number of the actors becoming partners to us in how we communicate these stories, and I can get into all of the things we do for authenticity to make sure that all the points of view, because I know what's at the bottom of this question is how do we reflect the points of view of people in countries and places that we're not from? And the answer to that is that we enlist these partners who are essential to how we answer important and difficult questions about politics, about culture, about how those places are characterized. For instance, 
Andy Baez, who uh, directed more episodes of Narcos than anyone and is a close friend of mine and is now directing another sort of spinoff series of Narcos, uh, is, is, is um, Colombian. He's from Cali. Um, he was be, became one of our most important directors and every piece of the process Andy would be involved in um, in order to vet like what we were doing and say, no, they wouldn't say this. Yes, they would say this. No, this doesn't make sense. No, the politics weren't like this. Colombians do feel this way. You're being insensitive here. You know, you're not listening, you know, this is like, I think you missed the point here. And all those conversations are essential and they go on constantly. And you can see Andy's influence in like the first episode of season three, which is set in Kali. And he shoots the city, he shoots it beautifully because it's his city. And he's very invested in, in that episode. If, and he was invested in all, but he was very invested in the Columbia stories. And he stayed with us in Mexico. We had Mexican directors. Um, so, you know, the, the, that process was always ongoing and it, and it, and it was really down to even small levels where we would be on set with the actors talking about translations, you know, down to like the granular aspect of how things are said, because we would, we have translators, but the translators don't always appreciate or understand the dialects or the, the, the sort of like, um, like syntax or so oftentimes we're on set talking to actors about, um, you know, no, I wouldn't say it this way or in Mexico City, they say this, you know, that's not right. Or what did they use Google Translate for this, which I heard all the time. And um, so so that's like, you know, and, and our actors were very involved in that part also of the sensitivity of how we Diego was always talking to us about like, this is what I want to say. This is what I want this to be, you know, because they're they were very invested in it too. So the process was really organic. It developed over time, but it was very much us investing in our partners, whether it was actors or directors, so that we could make sure we were sensitive in communicating the, all of the point of views we wanted as well as we could. One thing I would add to that, because I think it's important for this conversation, is that the politics was very important to us. And also it was very important to us the characterizations and making sure we weren't roman over romanticizing if, to any degree, although that's inevitable in some ways and we can talk more about that. But we really always set out to have a balanced point of view, which is why there's a cop point of view and a narco point of view and a political point of view. And we always felt that if we could capture all three of those and with the help of our partners, which also often our partners were real sources like the DEA, whom we enlisted uh, often, who were hypersensitive to these issues, you might be surprised to know. Um, they were very, very, you know, aware of these cultural issues and journalists and, and novelists, uh, uh, writers who also could help us with the political situations and understanding, you know, um, making sure we understood all the, the context for what we were doing. So, so that, that I think, um, covers all of our partners and how we enlisted them. There was a political, there was an economic drive to it, but it became an organic and really important part of how we were able to, you know, make this as authentic as possible. Authenticity was essential to us. That's yeah. super interesting. Though. Sorry, Vanessa, did you want to add something? Oh, I just wanted to add that I think that really shows in Narcos Mexico in particular, like the sound of Narcos Mexico to me is so specific to Mexican Spanish. Um, yeah. And it's interesting to hear how your Latin American partners are very committed um, to, you know, having that, the, I guess, the fidelity to their language being represented. Oh, it's, it, I mean, insistent and mm -hmm. at all times and, uh, and, and as a writer, you have to be flexible because writers are used to being able to saying like, look, I spent a lot of time writing that line of dialogue, but then someone is saying to you, yeah, but that's not how it would be said, you know, yeah. and, and like, I wouldn't say it that way, or I would add the curse word here or, you know, so I appreciate you saying that. And in Mexico, the fidelity is so important too, because 
you know, there were days where I was on set and I would be standing there and like, I'd notice the cast would just, or like the crew would just be stopped and looking and I'd turn around and there'd be like five guys that are like the biggest stars in Mexico standing behind me. And you realize that like, you know, that's important. Like, that's cool. Those guys haven't acted together and they were having a blast acting together. And, you know, that like, that was like Mexican culture in a scene, you know? And I'm like, you know, you get, I got chills thinking about it because it's cool that, that like we were able to do that, you know, because those actors don't typically get to act together. And I, I can go into why or the economics of that, sure. but, but, but because we, this is a little side point to your question, but because we're paying American prices, <laughs> if you will, we get a lot of attract and, and mind you also, we start to attract people because of our show and people wanting to be on it and get the exposure. But also, if you're an actor working in Mexico or South America, you wanna work on a show that's American-based show because you're gonna get paid much better. So yeah. Um, yeah. we were able to, we're always been able to attract an amazing cast. It's, it's so much fun for us casting these shows. And, and part of the reason that the cast is always spectacular is, and it's, and is we just get this pick of, spectacular actors and actresses when we go to cast um, and we have the directors who who they attract are attracted to and who understand the casting we have a great casting director as well that's amazing the cast is really incredible and uh, this is already you've given us so much to think about i want i want to stick with this topic for one second and maybe add another one I'm really curious, Doug, if you could give us a little bit more of a sense of that writing process, you know, because it sounds like there's lots of voices that are that are contributing to the final product. But could you just walk us through? I mean, like, for example, in an episode that you work on, would that go from English to the writer's room? Just what what you know, what is the kind of linguistic and translation process that happens as, as it goes from beginning to to end in the production? Specifically, the language process. Yeah. Well, I write in English um, and then all the Spanish is in italics um, and excuse me I'm very, we're very we're very conscious that the, the 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 English that is going to be Spanish is written in a way that that we would write dialogue mm -hmm. so sometimes we would have writers come in and they would write <laughs> they would write the Spanish dialogue like in a weird kind of arch way which was like that British I, I don't know what it was but for us like the dialogue is all written as we would write it in English, right? right. And as it be, it's about, because we're, we're concentrating on the character, right? And who that character is and who that character is, is partly how they speak, you know? Right. So for us, we need to communicate both to the actor and the translator that this is how this person speaks. You know, this is the way they see the world. And the best way for us to do that is in English, right? Because that's, that's right. our language. And then, then that I think for for the our partners who are usually the directors and occasionally actors like Diego, who spoke fluent English, had an English his mother's English like so he, you know some of the actors or we have American actors like Pedro who who's who's um, um, you know who speaks Spanish, who grew up speaking Spanish, um, and they or, or you know. And they would like um, be able to help us with that kind of like, I understand the intention here because that's the key. It's as, I'm, as I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just dig that level deeper of saying like, you need to understand the character. So it's very helpful that, you know, you have translators or actors or directors who understand that the, the translation has got to be sensitive to what the writer is trying to communicate about the character both yeah, in yeah. syntax, um, length of speech, you know, how much they swear, the, the attitude, the very attitude of it. And, right. and I can give you specific stories like um, the series I'm working on now uh, with Andy, um, um, just to give you an example, cause I think it, it may yeah. help. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm trying to like, so Andy, so we had the scripts, there's, there's six uh, episodes in this, this series we're doing. I can talk more about it, but I think we had the first four and we had the translations that were done by a very good translator. And, and I, 
went through and there were there were a couple spots where I and, and I do this where this the worst the the translation missed the sense of humor in the lines like it it was a very I write very dry sometimes very dry like very you know like clipped kind of jokes jokes is probably <laughs> being being generous they're like you know and so I had to I highlighted those to Andy and I said this translation is literal, you know, it's turning in a, a dry, like kind of her sense of humor, the main character who's a woman, a wo female narco, who has this kind of dry, sarcastic sense of humor. And it's making her <laughs> sound like she's, she's yeah. honestly saying this. And, and, and that's the kind of imbalance you can have in a translation. And Andy said, oh, and Andy being who he is, looked at that and he's like, okay, explain it to me because and he's, completely fluent in English, but these are the nuances that a non-native English speaker wouldn't catch, right? So we would talk about like, okay, Andy, this is what the joke is, right? Or sometimes with the cop dialogue too, then, you know, it's clip and it's like, you, you know, there's no subject or whatever. So we have to go through the syntax and talk about it. And he then went through every piece of translation and anything, and so did I, and anything that struck us where, that that was missed we would he, he would change to try and find but there were some things where he would say to me he's like Doug I, there's no translation for this like that's not gonna work yeah yeah like like turns of phrase like often like you know like a duck by any other color or whatever you know like right. you know stuff like that and they'd be like no nah, we don't you know and then you just have to come up with something different but that's 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 like a granular snapshot right. of the translation process Right, that's fascinating. Um, I want to change topics a little bit, and I'll bring in one of the questions that's already coming in. And this is about the tremendous success that the Narcos and Narcos Mexico ha has had. Um, we were wondering if the show's reception changed at all how you thought about the kinds of stories you could tell. Uh, did it did it free you up to do different things? And then there's a question coming in from the chat: Is there anything in retrospect you would have done differently? Um, so for the first one, I would say the main thing that the success allowed us to do was to continue. <laughs> um, you know, this show was designed as two seasons. When we first pitched it, it was literally what you saw in those first two seasons. Um, my writing partner, Carlo, and I had never had much luck in television because we always liked endings. Television doesn't like endings. You know, by economic design, no one wants a television show to end. But, but if you're a feature writer, all you think about is the ending. The whole build is like, how do I, you know, <laughs> well, how do I set this up so it ends well? So we designed those first two seasons to end with Pablo's death. Um, and to the point where, I don't know, we were probably thinking about calling it Pablo or something. And I remember getting in the elevator after the pitch and, and Eric, who's smart, you know, as a producer, it's like, no guys, you have to imagine more seasons past Pablo. And we're like, oh, and then someone said, well, we can't call it that Pablo or whatever. And then someone said, well, why don't you call it Narcos? And we're like, okay. So, so <laughs> that was the biggest influence that its success had was that when we finished and it had that success, we could then do the Cali cartel, you know? And then when we did the Cali cartel, there was a huge amount of doubt. It was so much pressure because everyone was like, well, you don't have Wagner and you've just got these guys and what are they brothers? And like, you know, who's this guy Salcedo? And like, we had all read the book that this third season was based on and knew it was a spectacular book and said right away, this is like, you know, an SB, like a political thriller, like The Insider. And The Insider was sort of our touchstone for season three because Carlo and I had both been involved in that. and. And like, which is, by the way, is a fantastic movie if you haven't seen it. And, um, and, and we were able to pull off season three and then they were like, okay, well, okay, but you, what do you do next? And at that point we're like, oh my God, now we're starting to feel like we have to keep going. <laughs> and it was jump and it was Eric's insight, which I think was really smart, which was to jump to Mexico um, because we understood that that's where the drug war moved, that after the Cali cartel, the cartels as they were in Colombia became suppliers and less dynamic. And, and, and as we documented in season three, 
you know, Mexico had built a new infrastructure and we had always, in, so by that point we had in our minds that we're working our way forward through the whole history of this, you know, and, and, and I think that was the biggest influence the success had. It didn't affect us in terms of like, I mean, how we told stories stayed the same. We were always interest, interested in like being true to what happened, but telling, making sure the characters were true as, as much as the events were true, which is an important distinction. I think that that's really a, the, in, at the essence of the show. We often got, because television does the, Netflix does this, all shows do this, they test your show and they tell you like what the audience likes about your show, right? So they give you this like data sheet that says, well, 90% like it because it's funny and 60% like it because they love the main character. And, and then that's the way that those executives approach your next season. They're like, remember 90, per, you know, it really does go that way. For us, one of the big things was authenticity. One of the big plot things that people loved about our show was it, it was authentic in their eyes. Um, so we were always conscious of that and we were always constantly made conscious of that and it was always something. So that is another piece that informed how we approached the show. What was the second part of the question? If Sorry. you would have, if you would do anything differently. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, n not really. I mean, nothing, I, nothing I can think of. I'm proud to say, um, you know, uh, uh, I think that there are times when we fell into certain tropes, you know, um, that were unavoidable. Like, uh, you know, any artists, you watch certain scenes, you're like, ah, I got lazy there. We got lazy there. Um, you know, there's a certain kind of like, um, there's a certain kind of like genre energy to what we do that sometimes is a little bit like um, hard to get out of the way of. And the volume of material and the number of people actually writing it, which was just three or four of us, sometimes was overwhelming. And it prevented us from maybe at times, in my mind, being as deep or as rich with the characters as we could have. Um, you know, uh, in this new series is much, We've really, because we have six episodes and it's a little bit more tailored, we're really investing in the character in, in an even deeper way. Uh, sometimes in Narcos, we were sort of like, this, there was churning through story and moving so quickly that we had to be really good about delivering character in very tiny, subtle, small ways. We had to ask it, you know, so that that is a piece that like we were always sort of struggling against is telling the amount of story we had, but still being able to like make these feel like rich and real characters who had real and dynamic personal lives. Um, you know, that 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 is like, I'm sure there are episodes and spots where I would say, I wish there was more character. Great, thanks Doug. That's really, that's really interesting, Doug. And I loved hearing you talk about how like coming from a feature writer perspective, shaped like how you wrote the show and especially the point you made about kind of wanting it to have this cinematic feel. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about how it fits within this genre more generally because Narcos is part of this tradition like since the 70s of producing more work or representation about trafficking and the drug war in general, which obviously tracks onto the history itself. Yeah. as you mentioned. So when you all were writing or conceiving of the show, did you have kind of cultural references or film references or TV references that you had in your, in mind? Or were you kind of thinking outside of this particular um, wheelhouse or genre for um, inspiration? Um, no, I mean, yeah, we had definitely had references, like inevitably when you're working like when you're trying to make elevated genre material, as we call it, or crime genre material, you know, you're you're very, very aware of the, the sort of standards that exist, whether it's, you know, Breaking Bad or Sopranos, or particularly The Wire, which is obviously very influential in what we do because The Wire sort of marries different storylines with politics in a very specific context. Um, on the television side, those were huge influences for us. Um, as well as, um, you know, like you watching our fair share of like, you know, international stuff because we wanted to be exposed to like 
what was going on in South America, what were the other drug shows there, you know, Fauda was something we talked about a lot because it's a very, you know, a very great example of, of, of like um, a very specific place in time. Um, and then of course movies, yeah, like we were very, you know, look, we're huge Scarface fans, but we understand the limitations of that characterization and how offensive it can feel, you know? Um, and we're here, you know, Godfather is obviously seminal for any writer who's writing in the crime genre because it, it's so real and, um, and the story is so emotional and it's so cinematic. Um, so all of those things are always points that are brought up or referenced or used constantly. Uh, we're all movie buffs and we're all sort of saying, you remember that scene or, you know, it's sort of the language we speak. Um, I think though that like where it becomes original is filtering it through a different point of view, you know, and telling the stories as they really did happen because they're insane and sometimes larger, so much larger than life, these characters. Um, there was a lot of times where we'd be like, this is different, this world is different, this is the part of, so there was very much a conscious, you have to be conscious of those genres, but then you have to undermine them and think of ways to do these things differently. And, and, and we had that by design because we had designed the show to be different in that it had these different points of view. Um, not that that was totally original, but it helped us to make it feel like not one genre, you know, because you have two genres married in one, you know, so you have a cop movie and a crime movie in the same story. Um, and then also the archival material allowed us uh, certain originality from, but then also just, you know, you are always aware of what people are expecting and you're trying to like turn those things over. So um, we are always trying to like be aware of what the genre convention is and go in the other direction, but always in the service of the character, you know, it's, it's, you can say those things ad nauseum, but you really want to be servicing the character. So Pablo's design was, was his design and the surprises were always about the fact that you wanted Pablo to do one thing, but he would do another, you know, and the same with Felix, you know, you, you kind of hoped he would learn one lesson, but then inevitably couldn't outlap, couldn't like, couldn't um, escape his own damage. Um, and the same with the cops, you know, you wanted to feel like, yeah, their pursuit of the bad guy was fun, but you really understood the sort of psychology of why they were doing what they were doing. Um, that's where you, you become cinematic, I think, where you're in the psychology of the characters, it feels emotional. And that combined with a very bold and expressive cinema, cinematic filmmaking quality where we have, you know, the money, which, which is helpful to make, you know, shoot on location, which we did, to have wide expansive shots to show these places as they really are. Um, that combination is really what makes it feel cinematic, you know. Um, yeah. Can I ask a quick follow up? Because you sure. just said something really interesting, like that, you know, like I think when you talk about um, prestige TV, like the best shows are thinking about character really deeply. But how do you do that and get at those types of questions that you just mentioned when you're hemmed in by what the characters did? Like these are historical figures, right? And we know how Pablo dies and we know what happened to Felix Gallardo. So you can you tell us like, you know, in brief, kind of how you deal with that tension between like wanting to get into a character's interior world and service them, but then being kind of, you right. know, limited by, by yeah. how we know that things ended. Great question. Yeah, it is a great question and really uh, challenging. Um, but, but Pablo is a good example of somebody who it was well documented that he had a great love for his wife and for his children. Um, which to us stood at odds with everything he did. And that was at the heart of his character. Um, and that was an essential truth of who Pablo was and, and is at the heart of almost, you know, every sort of moral, ethical, you know, emotional conundrum that he faces. The other piece of Pablo that was fascinating and emotionally connected, basically the answer to your question is you look for the piece of that character because where it becomes difficult is when a character is, is, a, is a monster, 
by the facts that are reported about them, right? How is an audience supposed to invest or like or understand a character who, based on what we know of them, seems to be a complete sociopath? Well, you look for the pieces of them that are human, you know, and those are well documented with Pablo. The pieces of Pablo that were human were that he had this Robin Hood part of him, you know, that he wanted to help the people from where he came. He had this ambition, this unbroiled ambition, like uh, unbridled ambition that really made him want to be a president. He really believed he could be president. And who, what kid doesn't like kind of identify with that? Um, and he, he loved his family. Then you combine those things with just the sort of grist for the mill, things of him being clever and having good strategy and like building an empire and empire building is essential to these characters. It's an essential part of, of, of what, what I'm fascinated by because it's where we intersect with the commentary on capitalism, which I could get into. But that empire building part is also endearing to people. People love to watch people build empires. It doesn't matter how shitty and how many bones those empires are built on. So all of that gives you so much and you end up sort of balancing that against the horrible things that person did. And those two sort of play at odds. And you also, one of the important things for us in executing exactly what you're talking about is really embracing the idea, which isn't always the case for development execs or for filmmakers, that these people can hold two truths at the same time, right? That for Pablo, in his mind, he believes he's a good guy, right? So we have to understand that mentality, like too often and so often, you know, these things are written from the point of view that Pablo somehow knows he's a bad guy. I don't know. Like, but for us, like, we have to understand that Pablo can hold the truth that his family is essential to him on the one hand, and that he can blow up an airplane full of people to kill one person on the other and marry those two and find some sort of logic for that, you know? And that's fascinating and that's where the character lives. And to give you like a really micro example, just beyond that, I wrote the episode that Pablo dies in the, the last episode, right? Which is a really good example of what you're talking about. So very much, most of that episode is very much in keeping with Pablo's last days, which are very well documented. But there are two pieces of it that are I think essential, there's a, there's a lot of dialogue that goes to this end, but there are two pieces of, three pieces of it that are essential to how you root for Pablo in that episode. Of course you're rooting for him because he's Wagner and you've seen him go all this way and whatever, but in the design of that episode, there are a few things that make you really, or are designed to make you feel so sad when he dies. One is the opening where you see this weird dream that he has that, that is really out of Pablo's imagination that he's president and he's in his office and he's he's actually president of Colombia and he's he's won you know and he's he's like smoking a joint and he's president and his family's there and a mariachi band comes in and it's like crazy and he wakes up and he's in this shitty place where he's hiding out and he's got this beard and you realize this is all in his dream right and it's his it, it's his 40 something fourth birthday and you know he's like singing happy birthday with his kids, you know, over a, over a speakerphone. And it's just so sad. And so you're like, at the moment, that moment locks you into Pablo in this moment, not the Pablo we knew, but the Pablo here and now who's in this shitty place celebrating a monumental birthday with having to be away from his family, dreaming of what his life could have been. And hopefully that Slat, like hooks you into the journey he takes over the episode. The other piece, which is again sheer invention, is he has a scene which is one of my favorite scenes with his cousin, you know, in who's in that, a ghost actually in a park. And it's just a very simple scene, but it's the guy's a ghost. And in a series that's like about authenticity and about things being clear, and all of a sudden Pablo is sort of losing his mind and he has a scene with a ghost. It's his cousin and it's about these two, it's about the fact that his cousin was his consigliere and his brother and he misses him and he's facing the end and he tells, it's about the, the love they had for each other and, and the fact that Pablo is understanding that it's almost over. Those are scenes that are just inventions, but, but he was, but the truth of the matter is he loved his cousin. They did have this relationship. 
he did want to be president. He was in that apartment. He did talk to his wife and his kids on that phone. So they're all based on, and that was how he was caught. You know, the way that Pablo was caught was talking to his wife on the phone, you know? So all, you take that kernel, those kernels of truth, and they become things that if you spend a moment sitting in his shoes, feel very emotional and connecting. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, I, ne I neglected to say at the outset that this is actually co-sponsored by our friends in Cinema and Media Studies. And I, what you're saying, I think, is going to just really enliven a lot of the discussions that, that are happening in seminars over there. But I, I wanted to switch a little bit because, um, as you know, Doug, this is also, you know, you're filming, as you said, you're filming in location in real places that have real histories. And, and as you know, I grew up in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. So this is this is a very, you know, this hits in a, in a special way, you know, because I saw what happened to Juarez, especially after Felipe Calderon militarizes and really just turns mm -hmm. that city, which in many ways was a much more interesting city. Juarez was more interesting than El Paso. People went all the time because that was just culturally, you know, um, musically, you know, in every way it was just alive. And then it just becomes this, this, this killing zone. So, so you, I, I, this is not anything new to you, but as someone who's filming in these in these places, and you know that artists that have been trying to tell these stories, even some musicians that have been trying to tell narco corridos, you know, they themselves are subject to violence. How does that security piece factor into the way you approach the the whole enterprise? Well, in Colombia, we were we had a couple incidents, but we were uh, we were okay, and we always had security. Um, in Mexico, there was a lot more security because it's a little bit diff more difficult there. Um, um, it was always something we were conscious of and very like uh, um, always very wary of like, you know, making sure when we're shooting that there was a lot of security and that the places were vetted and particularly in Mexico, we had a lot of security. Um, like we had a whole security team, there were protocols, there was like a lot of things we had to follow. Um, there were places we weren't allowed to go. Um, we had to have government support in some places. Um, but, you know, we did, we did try and make sure that it was as safe as possible when we were shooting there. Um, that's really just the onset stuff. And that's, like because there's incidents, incidents that inevitably happen um, when you're a, like a very like obvious target in these places. Um, in terms of like characterizing people who may not like how you've communicated their life or whatever, um, we're very conscious of when we do the narco stories, there are certain rules that we follow of trying to keep the authenticity, but also not of, you know, not unnecessarily offend anybody, you know, like we'd never have anybody snitch who didn't snitch. Um, one of the other rules is like, you know, you don't make someone gay who wasn't gay or it isn't, it isn't, who isn't openly gay because that's also like something. That, th so there's some of these rules that we tried to follow so that we didn't offend anybody. Um, we also, I mean, by hearsay, and I can go further into this, have heard that a number of these narcos watch narcos and love it. So there is a certain, um, you know, for better, or for worse, like, you know, fanish kind of, I don't know what it is, but like, I know Chapo watched Nargos, you know, like it's like, you know, you, they're, they're, they, so I don't, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, but the fact is that these guys like the fact that that stuff exists. I know sometimes with some of this stuff that there's an offense taken or whatever, but, and, um, you know, yeah, we're sometimes unsure what to take from that, but I think that the cultural sort of part of the, thing you were talking about Vanessa of all these genre movies do inform sometimes you know how criminals see themselves unfortunately um but we've never had any issues with our own security other than in the actual like locations we shoot in where sometimes it's uh an environment where we need a lot of security you know because we're very um uh, we're very obvious or it's very it's a it's a poor and dangerous place where we happen to be shooting um you know those types of things 
Um, so we need to make sure that like we have the right people on our side, security wise and government wise, um, before we we go anywhere. Uh, and uh, we did have one incident in Mexico where a location scout was killed, um, which was very unfortunate. But it speaks more to the danger of being in those places than that there was any connection between him and and Narcos or another Narcos. He was actually, I mean, for a moment. And it was often reported that it had something to do with what we do, but he was actually just in the wrong place at the wrong time, as it turns out, unfortunately, because, you know, um, there was a pipeline near there that was being siphoned by the gas cartels, which is a whole another thing that I'm sure, you know, Vanessa could go into more detail than I can about, um, but they mistook him for taking photographs of where they were siphoning gas. And they didn't know he was a location scout for Narcos. Um, so they killed him because they thought he was taking pictures of their siphon. Um, so it was just, you know, that's the reason for security when we're there is just the dangers of being in those places. Like you're alluding to in Juarez, um, like Juarez isn't a place we've been able to shoot um, for, the, for those reasons, you know? And um, I don't know, um, if Sicario was able to do much there either, or how much they were able to do, um, we haven't we haven't had much luck. We tend to shoot Mexico City for a lot of other places in Mexico, but we travel around to, to try and get as authentic of a, a, a simulacrum or whatever that word. Like you know, if we can't be in the place, um, you know, for Pablo Acosta's uh, death you know, that was a town, his, his, uh, his death, which, you know, is that sort of, you know, he held out in that border town. Uh, that town is actually on, you know, on, um, isn't far from El Paso. He was very much of that area and a great, there's so many great stories about him. I could tell you, Tony, and about the people and talking to his girlfriend who we use as a source, um, in the sort of back, the border fight there too. Um, but but the town we actually shot in for his death was in Durango. So it was in another place, but it's just, we found the town that looked, that had a river next to it and kind of looked enough and was cinematic enough for us to use as a parallel for the town that he he retreated to. Um, and, it, and it wasn't because we couldn't use this town, it just wasn't practical in that case. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, Vanessa, you want to you want to ask the next question? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned like that narcos, or not necessarily narcos, but other uh, genre police or crime films have shaped how uh, like criminal actors view themselves, and that kind of links to a conversation we were having yesterday with Osvaldo Zavala about how uh, where he was essentially saying much of the same thing. How like these cultural productions, we often think about like narcos limiting cultural production, but in some cases, or real narcos, not the series, I should say, <laughs> limiting cultural production, but in some cases, you know, they actually are cultivating particular representations of themselves. Um, but one question I wanted to ask you is about the representation of the police in these series, but I wanted to follow up um, in particular about something you were saying about kind of how you get at the authenticity of, of these events. And I think that's something a lot of people have admired about Narcos, the series and Narcos Mexico is the way that it tries to reconstruct these events. But I think there's also like the challenge that a lot of these events are only recorded by the police themselves, right? So like they're kind of limited by the sources themselves, you know, because in most cases, traffickers are not leaving, you know, a paper trail mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, and you talked a little bit about how you rely on, um, you know, certain Latin American um, producers and writers to help with that. But um, even in the case of these places, like they're still limited by um, the records themselves. So like, I don't know if this is something you can talk about just in terms of kind of the challenges of writing around these sources. I recognize also this is a very academic question because at least I'm a historian, so we love thinking about like where our sources come from, but it's, I imagine, just a challenge of telling these stories in general, right? That you're limited by the, the material you have about these this period of time in this topic. 
Uh, no, and I appreciate the question as as a as a historian fan, um, and and as a as a child of a journalist. My mom was a journalist, so I so for us, the sourcing is important because we can't just have one source. Although sometimes we're limited to one, but that is where we get truth is if we can have more than one. Um, to your point, so it is important to us that where we can, we can verify by more than one point of view. We can't always. A lot of times it's public record. A lot of times it's journalists and books that have been written. Um, I would say books are really essential to us. Books written by journalists, have, we've used quite a bit. And those are very well sourced. And then when we option those books, we also have as available to us the author. So we can then as a secondary piece, go to the author or go to their bibliography and cite those sources. We've also used journalists in Mexico and Colombia to help us source this material. We have conversations with them. Those are secondary sources. Um, the books are primary sources. The cops are primary sources. Um, and I understand what you're saying about the point of view. We don't, we, as, as a, as a rule, we do not speak just to be clear. We do not speak with the narcos. We don't aren't interested in their, it's not that we aren't interested in their point of view, but it's not a dependent narrative. It's not a, a reliable narrator, right? Like that can't be a source for us. The point of view of the guys that committed these crimes. Um, so it's the inverse of what you're saying, which is how, how do we capture their point of view? We can't talk to them because they're not going to tell us the truth, right? These are guys that like are creating their own fictions. Um, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but it's not part of our policy to speak to them. The reason the cops are valuable to us um, and, and, and I, I, we, don't, we don't just by rule trust what the cops tell us. But, and, and it may surprise you to hear this because it did me even as interacting with them, is that the DEA agents, and in this case, um, the show I'm doing now is actually local Miami cops. They're startlingly honest about what these guys are and their interactions with them. Um, cops are like soldiers and they're in a war. They don't, they know they, they're probably not going to win. And I mean, look, I'm not talking about street cops. I'm talking about cops that are detectives or DEA agents. So you're talking about cops that are like, very, are generally very smart, you know, in what they do and take great pride in it and work very hard at it and have to document it very carefully. DEA has a huge documentation process. There is an overabundance of paperwork because it's a government agency. So every DEA agent you speak to is incredibly well-versed in what happened, the nuances of it, the failures and frustrations of it. It's very surprising. I was surprised too, but it makes them great sources, you know, because they bring a huge degree of reality and cynicism to the job they're doing. They are very reliable and they won't, they don't tend to celebrate what they did, you know, which makes them that much more credible. Um, it's a really difficult job, and I appreciate it so much having interacted with them uh, and their families. Um, and I can talk more about our instinct for having them involved, but they have a really deep understanding of the politics and the people involved. And we always take it with a grain of salt that they have their own politics, of course. You know, but you'd be surprised how liberal some politics, some of these DEA agents' politics are. And we have our own politics that are tend to be more liberal. So when we feel like they're giving us their party line or the government line or whatever, we dig deeper and try and find the other piece of it. For stuff like CIA, which is the documentation is hard. It's really, um, it's really just reading as much as you can and collating. Um, and then again, just to give like a very specific example, I wrote that episode. I'm not just saying like, I'm just going with the episodes I wrote because I know them really well, but like I wrote the episode last season, not last season, maybe it was two seasons ago about the fixed election uh, in Mexico, which was very much about truth, a true story, right? And a lot of the detail from that came from one book um, that was really beautifully reported and um, we tried to back it up as much as possible um, and tried to be as true to it as possible. 
but he was really well sourced and the 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 book was really detailed and and the point of view was very strong about how um how the system had been corrupted and um the ways in which the election was stolen and to us it was really powerful because it was reflecting a lot of what was going on here um in many ways but had been sort of preceded in mexico um so that was a that was an episode and and then you know some of the so a lot of the sourcing for that was just from that book and that reporting which was really really good um and the bias uh, the bias in that was very pr against the pri so it felt okay to like like it what it didn't like it there wasn't a lot of people arguing with the fact of what they did you know in that case it was more the detail of how they did it Wow. As, a, as a really granular example, you know, how did they steal that election? Yeah, I know. If, if I could jump in, there, there's so much to talk about here. And I'm sure Vanessa has, a, has a, a few things to to follow up on as well. But just to stick with that episode, which was such an interesting episode, you know, for folks who haven't seen it, you know, apologies for the spoiler alert, but it's, it's Felix Gallardo who kind of literally kind of in the episode pulls the plug, right, on the on he the, literally pulls the plug. He literally pulls the plug. Is a right. little bit of dramatic license. The plug <laughs> was pulled, but of course. Yeah. So it is. It is. And that's that's what I wanted to ask you about. It is dramatic license. You know, we we that no, did. No, it's not Felix. It's um. What's it's the, it's it's the guy who supposedly did pull the plug. I mean, you know, he he he's the one. He's the dramatic license is that Felix was that involved that he was there orchestrating this. In yeah, okay. in the room. Yeah, exactly. Point taken. He was in the room but again. So that that's that's the liberty you took with the story. And I, I guess the 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 larger truth that you're trying to convey is that the the Mexican state and the narco industry, you know, much like the wire, these things are kind of a part of a whole, right? That they're they're entangled with each other, and so the yeah. the narco state works in these different ways. But I wonder if if the if you're not elevating the role of the narco over the role of the, the PRI and the state, I mean, is it in the service of the bigger truth, are you kind of distorting the way that the narco state has actually kind of come to be in, in places like Mexico? Um, I guess we, maybe sometimes we're elevating the role the narco plays, but one of the purposes dramatically, in addition to being true, that a corrupt government serves us is it's getting back to Vanessa's point of like, well, I, 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 you like Felix or you like Pablo because they're dealing with corrupt government assholes who are usually entitled bureaucrats who come from rich families, you know, and they make for good villains. <laughs> so I, I would say that like, we tend to villainize those guys as much as possible. And sometimes they're like, you know, sometimes I wish they were more subtle, the, the government villains. Um, PRI, it's hard to, to, it's hard to go soft on them. I mean, Jesus Christ, but, you know, excuse me, <laughs> but like, I, I think that, I think that if you watch that episode, you see that Felix is caught between a rock and a hard place that like, he understands that the only way he survives is if, if the PRI stays in power. So I think what we're always trying to do is demonstrate that weird symbiotic relationship between the narco and the government. But that symbiotic relationship isn't symbiotic. It's a little bit maybe more like the, the, the sort of like, you know, um, scorpion and the frog or whatever, where like, you know, where the scorpion is the government, where these guys kind of enter in at their own peril with the relationship with the government. And then the government becomes kingmaker, you know, and that very much happened in Mexico. And, you know, you know, the power that Felix gained by partnering was a, was a double-edged sword. It was sort of a fatal compromise. Um, so I think that that is the relationship we were fascinated by you know, and we're trying to capture the complexity of that, like, careful what you wish for, because I don't think Felix, and that was the point of the scenes where he's like hyperventilating in a stairwell, you know, which like, you know, um, yeah, I'm sure it didn't happen, but, you know, we, <laughs> Diego and I insisted it happened, you know, like, because he never imagined he'd be like, I don't think that he ever, 
I think corrupting the voice of the Ameri of the Mexican, you know, electorate would, at least for our character, was not somewhere he imagined himself being. And not because he has like great moral turpitude about doing it, but just because like, it's, it's like not his typical crime, you know? <laughs> I mean, um, so I think that um, stealing elections, the narco stealing elections was, you know, something that they probably did a lot of, but like, that was not what they wanted to be doing. You know, I, 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 I mean, at least in my mind, I think it was something where those are favor, that's the favor trading that goes on. And it's the kind of, you know, the kind of relationship these guys entered into that becomes treacherous when you right. have presidents that are more powerful than they are and have the army uh, listening to them. You know, it's like, Felix can't deal with the army. You know, he, he doesn't have that, that sway. So, so I think the way we see the government influence is it's really a piece of, of villainy that can be pure villain. The CIA and the governments allow us a lot of leeway to make a complicated villain for both the cops and the, and sometimes on the cop side, the American government is the villain, which we see with Kiki, where it's like, Jesus yes. Christ, they did no favors, you know? Um, so that those governments provide us with a political complexity and a villain. Um, yeah. You know, on, on this, there's a question in that's coming in the Q&A that I, it's on this point, Doug, and I want to share it with you. Um, the question is, with, with using these cops as sources, how do you ensure that you're not perpetuating the U.S. narrative and exploitation of a place and its people? While they may have credibility and seem truthful, history has shown that those that write about someone else's history do not tend to be accurate, especially when they're a player in that narrative. And, and if I could just add to this really interesting question, um, tomorrow, Vanessa and I are actually on a, a, a dissertation defense. Megan Ward, one of our students, has done a really lovely dissertation on on the imagery of narco saints, you know, Jesus Malverde, yeah. Santa Muerte. Yeah. And one of her points is that there's the drug enforcement really are invested in this mythology. You know, you look at the DEA charge coin, Santa Muerte is literally on it. So they yeah. are they're truthful, but they're also they're also invested in a certain imaginary that they're perpetuating. So yeah, just maybe your reaction to those ideas. Um it's true, the narrative that's put forward by government agencies is biased. The narrative put forward by specific agents when questioned correctly is not that, you know, um, particularly when you have Hispanic agents who have great sympathy and understanding of the cultures they're working in, which isn't to say, I, I also hasten to add, that there are white agents who also have great sympathy and understanding of the cultures that they're working in. Yeah. Um, that, but I, but as I said, we also take their point of view with a grain of salt. Like we understand their agenda. We're yeah. very conscious of their agenda. And we're very much in search of a balanced point of view. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's I, think, I think, and sorry, and I would just lastly add that, it, you know, the cops that we work with would never, you know, humanize the, the narcos the way that we do. So- right. So the part of the research I alluded to with Vanessa about understanding who these people are, that doesn't come from the cops, that comes from our own research. Yeah. And, 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 and so I think our balanced, our balanced portrayal comes from being able to show both sides, being yeah. able to humanize both sides, and seeing that almost every time both sides lose in some shape or form, you know, they just, there's no winners here. You know, um, so those are sort of the stop gaps for us to what is a very important issue and, and totally agreed on. And of course, where we started having our Latin American partners who say, look, guys, I think you're, you know, listening to the cops too much here. This isn't exactly what it's happened. Or I think you're being a little simple minded about how you how you characterize this. So there are a lot of for us um, what, what you might call like very like sort of um, checks and balances so that we don't run into the problem of strictly listening to the cops. What I mean yep, to yep. say is that the cops for us have the best on the ground point of view of what happened because they were there, yep. you know, and, and, and if you know, and you're worth your salt, maybe not a journalist, but a notch below or a historian, 
you can get cops to give you a detailed account of what happened without their bias. Right. You know. Right. And I, and I totally get the point that it, it's complicated and you want to see these contradictions and these complexities and really kind of, you know, um, uh, speak uh, in, in those kind of nuanced ways. And I appreciate that. One just one quick comment on, you know, you mentioned that Mexican-American agents would have a particular perspective. I, you know, that's interesting, but also at the same time, over half of Border Patrol is currently Mexican-American right now. And, you know, I, I would have major disagreements, but at the same time, you know, I, I get it. Like, I, I get why people on the border would be interested in, in these kind of jobs and doing it. And so that, and I, so I don't want to say that that complexity is not worth doing, but I don't necessarily think the fact they're Mexican-American would, would let them see that reality in a, in a, in a particular way or not. Um, no, but, but it, it doesn't. You're right. And that was true with Kiki. Um, we spent a lot of time with Mika and like, you know, her point of view was very, not very nuanced, you know, um, she's Mexican American, but her husband was killed in the drug war. Yeah. That'll um, give you a certain perspective. You, know, you have to, you have to under her, 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 her son is a drug judge, I'm sure, as you know, who's pretty conservative. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know, you know, I, I, they're all you the grain of salt is 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 always there you know and 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 i'm interested too in what kiki's how kiki i didn't get to ask kiki this but yeah. you know um you know how did it change how he saw himself as a mexican american when yeah. he went to guadalajara you know um that right. those are the kind of fascinating questions we do want to ask tony yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah, no, I think those are great questions. And just one more on this, and then I'll see if Vanessa has something, because this is so interesting, Doug. But I, I noticed in you know, the last season of, of Narcos Mexico, it shifts from the narrator being the voice of a DEA agent to the voice being of a, of a woman Mexican journalist. Was that, was that an intentional shift to try to, to decenter the DEA kind of perspective? Or, or just what, what was the thing behind that? Well, I mean, I, honestly, I was working on, I didn't work as much on the last season because I was working on this other, because we kind of have seasons going in right. parallel. Right. Um, but so I can't speak as much as I'd like to, to that decision. Um, the reality is, is that some seasons, the D, like in the last two seasons of the DEA show, there's a little bit of a compositing of agents. Um, we didn't have the actual agents so sometimes that's why like um you know we wanted to have someone who's real speak you know and it's just a, because sometimes we can't get the d agents or it doesn't fit with our story but i think that but i can't really speak to that decision as much as i'd like to all right thanks doug i wanted to follow up um a little bit on thinking about like casting and and um how you think about who to cast. I'm actually going to do like a composite of a number of questions we have here in the Q&A box. Um, so first, just as like a little personal anecdote, I was in Mexico City when um, Narcos Mexico dropped. And I think, you know, your Netflix box tells you what's popular in the place from which you're viewing. And it was number one in Mexico. So I'm wondering, um, I think that was like on day two of it um, dropping. So Obviously, I think we have my own personal data point of its popularity in Mexico, but I'm wondering, and some people in the chat are wondering if you can talk a little bit about local reactions. Um, and I think you gave us this fascinating piece from um, Narcos about like casting from different countries as a way of trying to kind of bring different Latin American countries in to a particular um, season. Um, so first kind of the question about local reactions and second along the question of casting like, um, and I think this is a question you all have gotten quite a bit but you know the question about why cast a Brazilian actor to play Pablo. Um, and if you can talk a little bit about perhaps the reactions in Colombia to that. Um, yeah, so Colombian reactions run the gamut, you know, but there was there is a fair number of Colombians who just don't want to see more portrayal of their country in that light, which I totally understand. Um, you know, I think they, there was an appreciation for our ins insistence on trying to capture the political complexities of what happened and not just glorify Pablo or glorify the DEA agents or, you know, 
but that we really tried to capture place and time in Colombia, both with Pablo and the Cali cartel. Um, but I understand there's a number of Colombians who feel that, like, why does this have to be? What is like the stories coming out of our culture? And um, I'm not insensitive to that. And uh, I understand the criticism. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't, I, don't I, I think that, you know, the flip side, and it's a harsh reality of the commerce of entertainment is that those are the stories that people want to see from from these histories, which isn't to say that, oh, that's all you should be telling. But but I will say a lot of people have gotten an education in Mexican and Colombian history and how those countries operate. And that is, I, I think, not just the bias of its Colombian is Colombia's drug dealers. Like, I can't tell you, I'm this is anecdotal as well, but I can't tell you how many people have said to me that they've traveled to Colombia since they saw Narcos. They saw the beauty of it. They saw the, the sort of like fascination, had a fascination with the people there from the show and loved being there. I Not anecdotal, the amount of tourism that the show has generated towards Colombia. Um, not saying any of this like balances that, but there is, a definite reaction in these countries of, of, of alighting a curiosity, both in the language and the culture, which is not, which is positive, can be positive, I think. Um, and I also balance that with the general populations, like, you know, understanding and appreciation for those cultures, for hearing Spanish, for listening to Spanish spoken, for watching shows that are partly in Spanish, and the influence television as a medium can have that is profound that we're very aware of that you see with gay marriage becoming, you know, gay marriage would not have happened without television. Let's be honest, like that television normalized, you know, that and normalizing is a word we use and talk about when we pitch these shows because we're normalizing things for people that they find scary, you know? Um, and that normalizing is really powerful. And I can talk more about that, but that is an influential thing. I don't mean to claim that we do it flawlessly or effortlessly or whatever, but it helps. Just seeing those people on television is a representation, whether they're doing good or bad, whether they're a cop or not. I can tell stories that I've been told by DE agents of visiting schools where kids want to be DE agents that are powerful to me, you know, I, I'm not saying uh, maybe that happens on the narco side, but the point I'm making is that, you know, you're getting representations of people that aren't on television to a lot of people. And that's really powerful. And how you do that is tricky because there's certain stories people will and are willing to watch. And I would say it's opened up a floodgate of people being willing to watch other stories from those cultures that don't necessarily involve narco. So that's the way I would answer that question. Granted, there's some, you know, politicking on my part, which I apologize for. Um, the, the answer to the question of Wagner is that Jose and Wagner were close. Jose um, directed him in the Elite Squad movies. At that point in time, it wasn't something, the question was, how do you, how do you cast someone who could play Pablo? you know, was really the question that was being asked. And the, I think the sensitivity to the language question was another step forward that we actually took in the process of doing Narcos where we started to become more conscious of that. It's still an issue we run into, you know, we still have, you know, characters from Medellin who, you know, will have actors try and do the Medellin accent. We're like, no, 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 you can't do the, you know, like, you got to just stick to your, so there's so many little nuances that I'm sure your audience will appreciate that we still can't quite handle, you know, like, or quite do, or like we have an actress who's Miami, who's playing a cop from Miami and she's trying, she wants to do the, the Cuban act, but it's not quite right, you know, so, so we can't always get the actor to do the exact right accent. In Wagner's case, it was a little bigger of a step. But here's the truth. Wagner is a spectacular once in a generation actor 
who did that role better than any actor of his age could have done it. So it was not an opportunity in that case we could pass up, but we were certainly conscious of the choice we were making. We were very hopeful, and so was Wagner, with that when he learned Spanish, which he spent a lot of time doing, that he was very eager to, to do his best to speak that, to, 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 to capture Pablo's Spanish. And But we understand that it isn't exactly how Colombian Spanish sounds, and everyone was aware of that. Um, but, 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 you know, I mean, you know, he, he, Wagner was very sensitive to that, very in tune with what, making sure he was as true to Pablo as a character, emotionally and politically and like family-wise and looks and like, I mean, the guy has a million more memes about him than any, you know, there's so much truth to that character. Um, that he did that is true to who Pablo was that I sometimes take the, I understand the criticism, but I also feel like, wow, wh what a great representation of that character is, yeah. is I guess my answer to that question without Thanks. sounding overly, like I'm, I'm, I'm skating by on the fact that he is a, a Portuguese speaker. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, you know, we're getting close to time. So I'm gonna give the last couple of questions to our, our, our viewers and participants and just grab a couple for you to uh, have the final word. One of them is about other shows that are, are kind of maybe inspired by Narcos. Can you comment on the Netflix series Somos, which is also kind of the Narcos story on the border? And that's one question. And then the last question is, what has been your biggest takeaway uh, or surprise from, from doing this show? I'm ashamed to admit I haven't yet got to watch Somos, but I will, so I, I can't really comment on it, but um, it's cool that there's people doing these shows. Look, like we're not the first to do like this type of thing, um, you know, it's, but it's cool that there are more people trying. Um, it's cool that this stuff is being shot in these places, the doors that were open to, like doing prestige television on location in other countries, you know, is, is amazing. It's amazing that shows like Tehran, you know, happen, you know, and um, Tehran is because of Fauda and because of Narcos. And, you know, here you have a show, just to reference another, I don't mean, I, I just can't speak of, but, but an example of a show that's funded like an American show, it's like all Israelis doing it. You know, I think they get as many Iranians as they can to help them. But talk about a show that is really difficult to like get a point of view of a people that are hard to get a point of view of that they work so hard at doing. And I've spoken to the guys that make that show and it's a great parallel to me, to Narcos is Tehran. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, um, it's a spectacular show. It has the same con conflicts and Tri tri it's the you know and it's Israelis so trust me it's loaded when they're talking about the Iranians you know and they're using Persian Jews oftentimes to play Persians um, so it's a fascinating parallel to think about and talk about but they really work to capture the politics of a country that we don't know or see and the pro the the, the effect that it has when you watch Tehran is I'm fascinated by Iran. You know, I want to know more. I want to understand more of the politics of what goes into that theocracy and to the struggle of the Iranian people to living and operating in it and also to the Israelis of dealing with it. You know, so I mean, I think these shows bring a lot to the to the conversation that we're having. Um the the second question was sorry the biggest, the biggest takeaways or surprise from doing it now that you're kind of wrapping that part of your career up um i think i guess the re the reaction to it being so like global you know that people love i always try i mean people ask me about it a lot like what is it that people love the show we joke that like there's always different theories oftentimes people joke that it's like they love the narcos piece like they're never wanting to see the dea like as little dea as possible because they just want you to get back to the narcos but then other people tell me they like the dea piece you know and that they like you know understanding those complexities 
Um, and then people say they like the authenticity, but you know, I think what people really respond to, and it is part of the narco story, and it's the part that like you see now repeated in a lot of television shows that are true stories, like all the way it runs the gamut, like all of these like startup shows, like the dropout and you know, we we crashed and whatever. They're about empire building, right? They're about our sort of the American dream. We call it the American dream, but it's unfair to call it that. You know, we've it's another thing we've sort of colonialized is this idea of the American dream because it exists everywhere. You know, this idea that you can be more than you are, you know, and if by sheer force of will, by being violent or being smart or a combination of the two and putting the right people around you, developing a family, if you will, of, of, of associates who you love, who are loyal to you, you can build an empire. And um, I think that concept is so rooted in who we are um, and really fascinating and is about, um, it really struck me as I went along that we were writing about capitalism. You know, that like, as much as it was about all these other things that at its root, the show is about capitalism because it's about the promise of, uh, of wealth and glamor and control and power, which are all the things that capitalism offer. Um, and, you know, for better, for worse. And I just think for me, that's really important and really fascinating and a dialogue that we're all kind of continually having given the state of the world, given the state of, you know, classism and the state of globalism and the state of our politics. And so I really, the biggest takeaway for me is that that was an opportunity, even though sometimes I didn't even know it, to like write about something that was so important to what was going on in the world. And that was really invigorating and cool to have recognized that and to be able to, to, to talk and think about that because I'm, just to sum up, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the American dream, but I, I've also now, we're confronting its limitations. And you know, you see um, uh, Elon Musk buying uh, 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 um, Twitter like a super villain you know, I'll drop $40 billion for a company. And I'm like, oh my God, like that's badass, but it's a narcos move, you know? And it's terrifying at the same time. And, and finally makes, someone said it. <laughs> Elon Musk is the true narco. Of our <laughs> he really is. I'm like, I think Felix would do something, you know, like it's a Much bigger so empire building than getting to Mars. <laughs> I mean, he's just like, I like love watching that guy because for all the same reasons, you know? And um, the New York Times had the best headline, which is that, you know, Elon Musk wants more freedom and less democracy, you know? <laughs> and I was like, yep. Like the, the, the contrast between what we understand is our right to live as in a democratic society versus what we understand is our right to, to pursue capitalist the agenda is is fascinating to me um and, and that is a takeaway for me that like i really stuck really like has really stuck with me given my politics and you know my my um and the way the world has gone yeah absolutely um we're just about out of time i i wanted to thank you for reflecting on these questions so thoughtfully and letting us kind of uh you know, pick out a few questions about the show, because I think you've helped us um, think about like the challenges of representation also in the context of a commercial enterprise. And I think it's not unique just to Hollywood, but to a lot of other industries. Um, yeah, so thank you for just letting us kind of go back and forth and, and chat about these questions. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted to echo that, Doug. It's so great to be in conversation with you. All, also great to be in conversation with Vanessa. Uh, we are so happy to be able to share this with uh, more people on our website, Latin American Caribbean Studies at the University of Washington. And we'll also have links with our other uh, guests in this series and some writings, including a, a, a nice essay that Vanessa wrote on uh, uh, on narcos that, that in many ways you, you responded to in this conversation. So, uh, Doug, thank you. We appreciate you. And we hope we can do this again, maybe even in Seattle. I would love to, and I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the conversation you guys are having about this and know that it's a conversation we have in the writer's room as well. And um, it doesn't 
it doesn't, it, 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 it's very important to the people here, although it doesn't maybe always seem this way, that we're representing and we are uh, sensitive to, you know, how we tell these stories. Um, it's of utmost important to us. And, and we're always great. It's always great to have the feedback of these questions because it informs how we move forward too. That's great. And also thanks to everybody who tuned in. Uh, this was a wonderful conversation. And uh, again, you. hope we can do it again. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys.